Okay, guys. Let's start. In times like these, being a citizen is a big job. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the virtues of self-rule and debate the state of our republic. Welcome to the Citizen's Prerogative Podcast. This is the voice of your nerdy host, Michael Piscatelli, and we are inspired by a co-host whose passion for our republic precedes him everywhere he goes, Raymond Wong Jr. Thank you, thank you. And it... I just must must mention the royal family in light of their financing of all of the history in this episode. <laughs> this is episode number 59. We are still in season three. And the title of this episode is going to be Forced Pregnancy Again. Oh. So... As the title goes, in general, with these episodes, you can get a sense of where we're going. Um, Although you don't hear right now forced pregnancy as a term that's getting thrown around as much as abortion. But really, that's what we're talking about. Do we force pregnancy or don't we force pregnancy? And who gets to choose? Let's go ahead and open this up with a paraphrase from Gandhi. And from Jefferson, and I mean Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders. If we measured society based on how we are treating our most vulnerable, it would get a failing grade. By far. Forced pregnancy and childbirth have a long and disgusting history in our country, in the United States, as well as in the world. The UN recognizes this as a human rights violation and tracks this as a global problem. I'm talking about forced childbirth. And and if you weren't tracking me, that is what happens when you don't allow people access to abortion. The slavery economy in the United States featured this function at its core, a potentially renewable resource for labor at cost, or an asset to be sold. Plantation owners would routinely force pregnancy on their slaves and their wives for the sake of the business. You need heirs to take over your business. You need slaves to operate in the fields. You have semen in your loins, and you can populate your plantation. From that perspective, it's pretty easy to see how it was a patriarchy that we've stumbled into or have had imposed upon all of us. We must also mention that sexual violence is a part and parcel for much of this, you know, including the opposite. I'm talking about forced pregnancy, but the opposite of forced pregnancy is forced sterilization. So that was another factor. If they had no interest in you breeding or Possibly you didn't listen well enough, and as a punishment, you will never have another child again. Essentially, no bodily autonomy. And we have a longer history of no body, bodily autonomy in this country than we do freedom for women and people in general. That was um, a powerful set of statements, and uh, it really washed over me, and I was I was thinking, you know, these it's it's very it's a travesty what was happening during these times. Um, But we have to also shed light on on the north, I think, a little bit. So they were doing the reverse, right? They were they were they were not leveraging slavery for their economy, but they needed to be competitive. So they put their children into the factories, understand that, right? So the youth and, and, you know, you put your entire entire family to work essentially. So, so if you had able-bodied children, you know, the North was, I think there's still a similar situation going on for the poor working white, right? So the barons were controlling um, one population segment in the South. And then in the North, you had the poor working white or the other minorities that made it into the cities and such. Oh, totally. A hundred percent. That's an excellent point. And then especially on the immigration front, because when the Irish and the Italians and other people came, 
they weren't white when they came off the boat. <laughs> they were fodder for the factories, just like a slave would be in the South on the plantation. I suppose with a little more freedom, but not much money to uh, execute on that freedom. Oh, feels like a... Uh, feels like a whole system of the haves versus the have-nots as if the uh, the constitution of the united states was created and put into place by a bunch of wealthy people <laughs> they would have you call them enlightened please oh isn't that the truth enlightened in all the ways except for the ones that they didn't want to look so some of the preceding points we've made and others you know are are um, actually clearly articulated in an amicus brief from Howard University School of Law for the recent Dobbs case that went before um, SCOTUS. So the Dobbs case, I imagine most people right now, but if you're listening to this a year or two from now, hopefully maybe you don't know what the Dobbs case is. That'd be great. And everything's back to normal. <laughs> but the Dobbs case is the one that just went through and, and um, Supreme Court used that to send abortion back to all the states. So the states get to legislate abortion and forced pregnancy, as I'm going to be referring to it now for, for the future. And what's interesting is this amicus brief, if you're not familiar with amicus brief, anybody who's a friend of the court, law schools, nonprofits, companies, lobbyists, whoever, anybody who has an interest in a particular case and wants to express some opinions, legal or otherwise, share some experience, help the court understand, have available multiple perspectives around a case. Groups outside the court can submit amicus brief. It's up to the court to review. They can decide what to do or not do. It's just informative. It's just giving the court more information to help inform its decision because justices are not experts in everything. They cannot be. And so the experts come and they supply amicus. This, this was one amicus brief from Howard University. And when I was talking about the history of the slavery and forced pregnancy, I, I borrowed heavily from their amicus. So for instance, I, I have a piece I pulled out here because slaves were property after Congress prohibited the importation of slaves in 1808. Slave masters who could no longer rely on the international slave trade to replenish their labor force gained an acute economic incentive to govern Black women's reproductive lives. Female slaves were valuable to their masters not only for their labor, labor but also for their ability to produce more slaves. And that I pulled as a quote from the amicus brief. As far as um, revisiting forced labor, there was another uh, perspective that came to us from Northwestern University's School of Law, and it provided another legal perspective for consideration on this situation. As a component of the 13th Amendment and, and looking at it through um, a faculty working paper related to abortion, one of the things that they found in looking at that um, is that if you force anyone into pregnancy, that is nine months of servitude. So going back to the 13th Amendment and abortion is in the 13th Amendment, it says people are no longer allowed to be put under the conditions of servitude. And the argument that this faculty working paper case makes and I've seen it echoed in other places, is that if you force a woman to be pregnant, then she's in servitude for nine months at least. And that's assuming she survives the ordeal. And so it's a, forcing a woman to remain pregnant is a violation of the 13th Amendment under that perspective. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's enough yeah, for the it's, law It's, it's deep, ahead. it's deep. I, and I, and it's, it's, it's difficult for me to think about, you know, you're forcing me to reckon with the idea that you know, we're all part of the same struggle. When we see people on the street corner, we can't look at them as someone who's separate. We need to look at them as us. We need to say that that's the range of my available prosperity in the United States within the world, definitely. Um, but let's let's be more realistic. This is what makes me feel like I have to stop thinking because if you think about an economy with slavery, that just brought down the base for everyone, right? If you have free labor, 
renewable yeah. labor, it's like robotics, right? It's almost like we're re-examining a, a reverse side of this whole situation, um, you know, that's coming. So uh, with the with the, with the labor and automation coming, you have free labor coming back, hopefully in an ethical way. Um, but you, in a turn, in a turn, it's very difficult to say, <laughs> especially with all the news going around. But I think that's what's challenging is, for me is we cannot, again, look at yourself as, I think we are really good as citizens looking at the wealthy and being, oh yeah, that's within my range. But if you think you're due wealth, you need to look at the poor and say, well, that means I'm equally as due and it's as probable that I will be there. That's exactly right. The worst case scenario is available for all of us, except for the most wealthy among us. And that's by their design, okay? Not by their greatness. We won't go into that now, but our tax system advantages the rich <laughs> over all of us. So <laughs> it's not because they're great people um, or smart or amazing. It's just because they're rich. All right. Sorry, I keep breathing deeply into the microphone. This is a, it's a deep topic for me. Citizen Do Good might pull their sponsorship if we failed to mention um, that according to the literal text of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, citizens are born or naturalized and will never be deprived of life, liberty, or property. The unborn are clearly not citizens and not entitled to rights. But when you talk about not being deprived of life, liberty, or property, Nine months of pregnancy is definitely an affront to that. Mm. So in spite of all the perspective of history that was reestablished for the record in painful detail during this conversation that we're having now, <laughs> and the fact that the Constitution does not grant rights or privileges to the unborn, Dobbs, this case, that threw everything up into the air became the case our religious court used to put reproductive rights back on the legislative block for all 50 states. So much for liberty. And um, now we get to spend so much time and energy distracted by fighting this thing that was so already long, hard, and fought for and had been won. Um, we're going to be distracted from some of the other major things that need to be addressed that are new problems, not this old patriarchal idea. With that, it's time for our break. Here's a message from our sponsor, Citizen Do Good. Fulfilling a dream where all possess an intrinsic love for self-rule that is reciprocated with free speech and equal justice under the law, Citizen Do Good values the promise within the Constitution and our nation's founding documents. Taken together, they form a framework and an operating manual for our republic that provides us with the means to change with the times. The time is now to deeply re-examine ourselves and our implementation of governance for the dawning of a new day. We are a proud sponsor of the Citizens Prerogative Podcast, a major partner in spreading the good word about civic love and the power of change for us all. At Citizen Do Good, we want to empower all citizens to participate in their republic in a reconstructive way. With that goal in mind, we need your help to stay on mission and grow this community. Please rate the podcast with five stars on iTunes through the app on the web or on your device. If you don't feel like you can give us five stars, let us know why on our sponsor's Facebook page, Citizen Do Good. Also, make sure you join our newsletter at citizendogood.com. You'll get updates every couple of months on all of our antics, not just the podcast. Plus, you'll receive the Guide to Good Thinking by Citizen Do Good for free. Feel free to share any suggestions you have directly through the Contact Us page. Thanks for your support. When I think about the past and, and what's brought us to this point, um, losing these rights, right? seeing our fellow citizens women losing these rights it's 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 tough for me to imagine but yeah, i've heard some interesting things about how we've gotten here as a nation right it's it, it it wasn't done by legislative action usually it was a bold move of the pen stroke of the pen even lincoln uh when he emancipated the slaves um as i understand to kick that effort off it was just an executive action he didn't even have 
all the support. He just did an executive action, as I understood, which kicked off that movement towards set, pushing ourselves away from slavery as a nation, saying we would free them once we ended the war. And this is what led to a huge swell of people joining uh, the army, right? That they had a huge conscription of, of Black men who joined to fight uh, and join the military with the Union. So I, I believe that we cannot look back and say, oh, it must be done through legislative. Oh, it must be written into. Oh, there, there are great moments in history. And the court stomped on that. It's it's almost like they must have been part of the civics classes that didn't have history as part of them, right? It was all philosophical future and how we're a great nation and how we're setting the tone for the rest of the world and not the important past that happened. There are reasons why people made bold steps, bold moves. Are we going to argue that slavery should go because Lincoln kicked it off wrong as a matter of documentation? Should we give back the Louisiana Purchase to France because, because Jefferson didn't go through Congress? What is the, where do we stop government well, specific, specifically the courts right now. Totally, yeah. I mean, and I, I imagine this is the component of checks and balances, um, or at least the hope of the vision of checks and balances to say, okay, this thing's getting out of, it's listing, it's getting out of line, starting to cause some tension everywhere else. Um, hopefully we can restore that balance trying times i won't talk about political parties and and their part in all of this too because you mentioned civics and i was thinking to myself you know who benefits by not having civics in schools the people who get a competitive advantage owning the corner on civics both the parties they must have agreed to take civics out of the schools so that they could own civics hmm. okay i digress <laughs> let's move into calls to action we're actually doing pretty good on time. One of the things that this podcast and Ray and I and, and anybody who joins us over time, we will always try and challenge others to do is learn more about the United States, learn more about our history, especially the uglier parts. The uglier parts are the most formative parts of our country. Um, the biggest reasons we've ever done anything are from the ugliest things that have ever happened. It's a very reactionary system. We're not so good at planning and you know plotting for making the better future. We're better at reacting to a bad future now to make the next one better. So that is why it's so important for us to look at history and see the capacity for this system to do bad, to do wrong, um, in the sense that it's things that are not collaborative, they're not helpful to us as a community and a species. The parts that act as warnings through history, if we only learn them, these very ugly things, anything, again, <laughs> is a bad slogan. When we learn all of the atrocities of history, if you're trying to do something in America again, chances are it's pretty ugly. That that's beautiful, and I uh, has so it's poetic almost. There's so many meanings behind that one. Uh, it's the uglier part is the most interesting part, and you have to be very aggressive here in the United States because there have been people that have died off, but they did a really good job at setting up our museums and our historical societies and our mission statements and all of the foundations of the United States museum system have their roots tied in a little bit of this whitewashed, I'll call it. I'm not gonna use the power words that are out right now. It has been whitewashed. And it's because we wanted to tell the good story, right? We didn't wanna talk about the depression that some of these historic homes have gone through. They didn't wanna talk about it being a red line neighborhood. They just wanted to restore it to its historic past and love it. 
And that story is probably repeated throughout the country. And so we should, you have to actually pull back the veil of the museum. And when that curator says, do you have any questions? Say, yes, tell me more. Ask the questions about the history they don't talk about. What happened to this house after or during the depressions that you know happened? Try to pull peel back the onion. And it, it is sweet. Some onions are sweet. Yeah, I'll, I'll argue that knowledge is always sweet, even if it's a bitter fruit. That was a great call out, um, especially around the museums, because the museums have been curated through bias, all of them. So what bias is it? You know, maybe that's what you go in, like thinking ahead of time. Let me do my best to sense is there bias? Is there something missing? Is there something hidden? Are they tap testing or avoiding something? Like that should actually be the challenge for all of us every time we go in a museum is, okay, I am here as a bias detective. Oh my, that might be a document that comes out, but, but that might be a good question anyways. Like what is your museum doing to work on its cultural bias? And if the curator runs out of the room, you know, we're <laughs> onto something. If they don't want to talk about bias, oh, that tells you everything you need to know. And you'll have to talk to someone else <laughs> to get the story. Uh, so start um, start with that. Start with a group or a museum or a set of events um, even that are relevant to, to today, to you in your life or the news that you see keep coming up. And it's something you don't know about. I mean, because you can watch the news. They're never going to tell you the history of anything. They're just going to throw it out there like an outrage or this or that. And it's like, okay, but why? Why? It's so important to ask that question. You know, where, where does where does the basis for all of this come from? Because we're only seeing the tips of icebergs when we're scanning the fractured and dysfunctional media ecosystem we have today. Be curious follow the money, right? Follow the money is something you hear a lot of. And, and just remember that clicks matter and you see these. And I, I frankly stay away from it. When I tend to see sensational documents or sensational articles, I will review them as a matter of just checking it. And if it is what I thought, if it was clickbait, I will block the organization or whatever page it is because I, I have to look at Facebook and things like that. You have to maintenance it. You have to block those individuals who are sharing that kind of sensationalism, which includes a lot of news organizations too. Totally. This keyword clickbait headline culture is all about invoking whatever your emotional addiction is. Sadness, anger, excitement, puppies, cuteness. It doesn't matter if you're if you give yourself to any of those emotions on a regular basis and you follow the clickbait it's going to take you where you're going. And that's unhealthy. It's actually unhealthy for us to be doing that. You need to be aware of it. But like you're saying, Ray, you know, you got to, you got to click through it and you see what it is. And now you've learned, now, you know, <laughs> don't go down there anymore. <laughs> or the next time you do see something from them, you understand from what perspective they're, they're bringing it up. It's probably not to inform you. So I think this is just a reiteration of what we've been talking about. I, I mentioned here to keep an eye out for headlines, keep an eye out in headlines for clues in your search, um, because most stories today lack that historical context. So I think we've belabored that now. And um, our last call to action here is going to be a familiar one at the tail end of this year. <laughs> Vote, please. Um, we have... At the time this episode is dropping, we should still have an election coming up in November 2022. Support the candidates that support civil rights for us all. I, I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Voting is important. If you imagine what happened in this uh, last major election cycle, um, and if you're watching years from now, <laughs> you know, hopefully we can look back in the history books and say, wow, what an interesting time. Um, but voting does matter. Every vote counts. And by the way, if anyone in your family says voting doesn't matter, I don't know where that propaganda came from, um, but you can send them to us. Tell them that there's a voice here that's willing to 
guide them and, and tell them how their voice does matter. Because we believe that every citizen is contributing to a greater society. The wealthy believe it. They cash that check every day of their lives. Hear, hear. We have been your hosts. Thank you, Mr. Raymond Wong Jr. And thank you, Mr. Piscatelli. This has truly been a historical briefing. Mm, it's been something, that's for sure. For information on this and other episodes, head over to citizendogood.com and click on podcast. While you're there, hit up our contact us page and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from the community. Special thanks to you, our listeners. We save the best for last. You are the best and you have been for years. Thank you for your support. We know it's painful and we love you. Intro music sample from OK Class by Ozzy Jock under Creative Commons license through freemusicarchive.org. Other music provided royalty free through Fizzly and Studios, Inc.